Welcome to this episode of Husbandry, uh, where we try to take an institution that explains so black and white and learn how to live it in color. I am joined by one of my favorite guys. I don't get enough time with him because we always say we're gonna hook up, we're gonna hook up, we're gonna hook up, and then we we're all, we're off our separate ways. Um, but I know him. I'll say it at least one time affectionately as Deacon Rod from my church, but we're gonna call him Rod on the podcast. Um, uh, Rod, how you doing today? Doing well, man. Doing well. Man, I thank you for joining me. I, I, it's such a privilege for me to be able to sit with men who have been married um, for decades, uh, who have raised children, and be able to glean some advice from them. But I realized as I talked to my friends or different people that I've known, um, that it was an extreme privilege for me to have all you guys around me. And I wanted to start a podcast to be able to get this valuable information that I've been getting all my life about marriage and actually giving it and letting other people partake in it. So let's start here, or this is where I always like to start. How long have you been married? 27 years. 27 years, 27 years. All right, out of those 27 years, if you can describe your marriage in one sentence, what would it be? It's been, I would say, it's been, um, wow, one sentence. It's been a nice ride. That's what it's I would say. It's been, been a, a nice, nice ride. ride. Yes. It's been a nice ride. And we know you know a good ride because you're a car <laughs> guy. So we know you know what a good ride is. It's It's been a nice ride. So take me back 27 years ago. One of the questions that always pokes at my heart when I'm talking to men is why did you get married, right? Yeah. Why, why did you take the chance? Did you take the jump? Did you have the faith? Were you interested? Why did you get married? Yeah. So it's interesting because a lot of my thought process has been developed by my experiences, which is most of us, right? I'm, we're, we're made up of our genetics and our experiences. So my family experience wasn't that great. Very, mm -hmm. you know, we all, we all come from dysfunctional families. The question is, is how dysfunctional is it's right. It, right? So now with that said, you know, my pop is going to be with the Lord. My, uh, my mom as well. My pop was a woman beater. Mm. So I grew up in an environment where, you know, it just wasn't a, as fruitful as it could have been. And what it mm -hmm. made me realize is that I really want that. I want, I want the opposite for my marriage. And then I hung around my, uh, my friend and I watched his parents. It was a, it was a blessing. So I was like, I want that. Mm -hmm. So that drove me to um, number one, kind of reclaim what I felt as though I didn't get when I was yeah. young and see that, you know, being involved in, in growing up in a, in a relationship with my parents where everything was really, uh, you know, loving and tight. So I said to myself, you know, when I get married and I want to get married, I want to get married because I wanted to share my life with someone, you know, it, it, I just didn't, I remember I was out there, man, just, you know, just out there. Yeah. I'm not going into no details, but I was just, out there just with, you know yeah, just out there said enough I was just out there that just, just that said there. enough that's right <laughs> right so at that point I got tired I'm like man I want to deal with all this man it was just like over and over again going through these women and not you know the, the expectations weren't were low and I was like I need somebody that I could share things with I want somebody that, that that's engaging I want somebody that's going to stimulate the way I think and make me more than what I am that's why I ended up getting married, you know, and then, and then basically um, at that point at the time, I wasn't, I know I was going in the right direction, but I wasn't a hundred percent sure, but um, yeah, that's what made me get married. I know I wanted to be better than what my mom experienced. So you had your family um, relationship and that showed you a certain part of marriage, but then you had this friend and you saw his parents yeah. Uh, how important, two-part question, how important was their example 
And do you think people who are looking towards marriage need an example of a good marriage or can point to a good marriage to help them in those beginning years of being married? I, I think so. And I'm going to tell you why. When we, we don't come from homes where we have a lot of guidance and a lot of teaching and uh, you know, if we don't have parents that actually believe in something, if they don't have a foundation where they could say, hey, this is what we believe in and this is how, this is how we roll, well, you need examples then. Mm -hmm. So those examples end up steering you in the right direction if you got a great example and you don't have that example at home because you end up gravitating to that, at that example. You gravitate to that couple, you gravitate to that man or that woman who've already established that. And then if you're an inquisitive person, you ask a lot of questions. Yeah. How do you do that? You know, why you've been married for that many years? How did you go through it? How did you guys yeah. deal with, you know, you ask all these questions that to, to try to basically build up this knowledge base to how to do it. Now, if you believe in, um, you know, if you have a, a belief system and that's your mm -hmm. foundation, depending upon where you get that, those two things come together. But if you don't mm -hmm. have that at all, you can actually maintain that great marriage based off some example of somebody who believes in that who, or has that foundation that they can, they can move forward with. Yeah, I, I, that's one of the areas where we try to fight as people that we're not influenced by others and we and that all behavior is not learned, right? Which has been psychologically proven that all behavior is learned. And so often we try to think that we're doing our own things, but we've learned how to do this yes. from somewhere. So yes. let's talk about learning for a second. Um, there was a lot that you had to learn when it came to being a husband. But before we talk about what you had to learn to be a good husband, what did you have to unlearn mm. from your upbringing, from when you were out there, from what are the things that you had to deconstruct and get rid of in order to be ready and available and to have the attentiveness to learn how to be a good husband? What did you have to unlearn? You know, I think the first thing I had to unlearn is just some of my natural tendencies. So we're all, once again, if we go back to genetics, we all have these natural tendencies, you know, whether you're a choleric type of person, if you're sanguine, phlegmatic, melancholy, these natural tendencies, some of them, there's some weaknesses involved. For me, patience yeah. is one of them, mm -hmm. right? And I had to basically be a more patient person, but I had to recognize that first. Yeah. In many cases, we don't know ourselves well enough to actually unlearn because some of that unlearning is unconscious. So yeah. we can bring that to the forefront, right? Now we can actually learn about the unconscious piece and then work on that unconscious piece. But I think it's very important that we hold people, uh, that people will, we, we have people that we give permission and that we can, um, they can hold us accountable. Because you think about it, your brothers, your sisters, some of your best friends, your mom, your dad, they know you best. Mm -hmm. So if we can share with them that we're trying to get better, then they will help us get better regarding those hidden areas. So patience was one, uh, I would say, uh, hold it. See, I hold myself, uh, I, I, I would say, I put a lot of uh, I put a lot of stock in myself as far as doing things right, and sometimes I I may project that expectation with somebody else. That was another mm. thing that I had to <laughs> unlearn, right? Yeah, but it's a it's a journey, man. Yeah, yeah, man. It is. Um, I often sit, um, whether I be in therapy or whether I'm just reading the scriptures or whether I'm talking to another man. And when you talk about being a husband, you often realize how your own personal expectations shape the expectation of who your wife should be. Right. Um, and when we are, when we look at 
our wives through those expectations, we don't give them the chance to naturally show up as who they are, right? Especially when you have a choleric personality or, you know, you very straightforward, look, this is what I want to do, this is where I want to go. Um, how, as a husband, have you given your wife the room to just be her, right? Like I married you because you are you. And I know at times I may expect this or expect that, and that's not you. I want to give you the permission to push back on me because I want you to be you and not this person that I control or I get the chance to create. How have you given her that freedom as a husband? So I remember when we first started, we first started dating. One of the things that I did is it was for me, it was part of the vetting process, but we used to go out and I saw we do would talk, man. We would talk like for hours. So we would yeah. be sitting, I'm gonna tell you where we, we would we go. We would go down Zanzibar Blue, the original one. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. right? And we would sit in there and just talk for hours. We might listen to a jazz set, then we would finish and we would just talk. We would get back to the, you know, I would drive, you know, drive her back home before, before that. We might, if it was summertime, we might be outside before I dropped her off and talk for another hour. But what yeah. I did is I established the fact that number one, we could discuss anything because that's how we started. Number two, I wanted to always um, give her permission to say, hey, this is where you upset me. Mm. And then we can have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. This is where, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you know, this is me. Are you accepting me for me? What don't you like about this? What don't you like about that? So I think once I started really giving her a place of safety to have a mm -hmm. conversation, it, it kind of like maintained from there. So she was the one that would shut down on the conversation. And I remember, you know, when I first learned about, you know, that verse in the Bible where it talks about, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, don't let the uh, sun go down on your wrath, right? So for me, yeah. in our first, the first um, years in marriage, and I would not, I, and she'll tell you this, you can straight up ask her, I don't go to bed angry. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want her to go to bed angry. So we talked yeah. that thing through. Right? Yeah. But she'll tell you that, mm -hmm. like, nah, right, I don't play that. I don't like, you know, I don't like, I'd like, you know, we get to a, 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 a you know a discussion, and or one of us is mad, she's mad. I say, listen, first of all, I don't. When it comes down to her, you know, work on that patience thing. I don't really argue. I don't really get upset. There may mm -hmm. be disagreements, or or somebody, you know, it's no, there's no, you know, there's no uh, hollering things of that nature. Just not, mm -hmm. just not me. But yeah, I would say something to her like, I know she pissed off at me. She shut down. I would say, listen, I know you may not want to talk to me right now, but I'm available when you feel like talking, okay? Yeah. Just letting you know I'm available. So when you're ready, yeah. we'll do it. And then finally, I, and then I go up, I, you know, I, I might roll up on her and, and I might smile or something like that. And then she's ready to talk because I broke the ice. Mm -hmm. But right. I, would have to, I would have to do that but the reason why I have to do that, because I know me and I know her. And if I know her well, I know what to do to basically break down that that barrier from, from, from us communicating. Yeah, man, that's um, big. My wife and I, um, we call them our top tens, right? We haven't had 10 of them yet, but we've had those disagreements and some of them have turned into flat out arguments where we're just like, Oh yeah, that was a top 10. That was just too much. <laughs> yeah. um, and we realized in every single one of those situations, we both stopped listening to one another. Mm -hmm. It was no longer about trying to find a common solution. It was at, at that point when it gets into a top 10 is what you have done or what you have said offended me so much in this moment that all I want to do is give you an earful. Uh, how important is listening um, for effective communication in a marriage? People, when they hear effective communication, they automatically think talking. I need to be able to explain my point in the best way to make you understand. But rule number one of effective communication is actually good listening. How oh important is listening in oh order gosh. to get over those humps and those disagreements that are going to come? but they don't have to linger and they don't have to mess up stuff that 
it should have never messed up if we listened well in the beginning. Man, man, serious, man. It's um, man, it's like every time, Darren, I go on a, I, I'm I'm dealing with an engagement at the job, an engagement, and uh, the number one thing comes up is communication. So mm -hmm. think of it, we are human beings. We are not made to be on an island. We want to interact, and if it, it, it's probably it's easy to say that the most important thing in our lives is relationships. Mm -hmm. That's so right. So at the end of the day, that means that if you and I got a relationship and we're having communication problems and those communication problems are my fault, I might have those same communication problems with everybody else in my, in my circle. Safe to say? Safe to say. Safe so, to say. So now yeah. if, if we say that the communicate effective communication now we're talking about uh, body language. We're talking about active listening. We're talking about tonality. We're talking about micro expression. All the things that may interrupt me and you from communicating because you see the smirk on my face. And now all of a sudden mm. you just stop in your tracks and go, well, why you got that look on your face, man? Yeah. So effective communication, man, is all of those things wrapped up. And once again, it's all about you and I or our wives making the place safe, right? But understanding the fact that the whole thing about listening, I'm going to tell you right now, depending upon the people and depending upon the topic and depending upon the setting, I'm a much better uh, listener if I'm actually programmed for it. In other words, yeah. I might be inside the room with you guys and we're talking sports. I'm going to talk all over you. You know yeah. how we do. Yeah. I'm going to talk all yeah. over you. Yeah. I'm not listening because I don't really <laughs> want to hear what you got to say. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Right? Yeah. However, if I'm, in a, if I'm in a situation and I'm coaching, I'm in coaching mode. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in coaching mode, my listening skills go way up. So mm -hmm. what do you do? You get in coaching mode with your wife. Now, if you get mm -hmm. coaching mode now, and I'm like, I'm listening. I got everything out, man. I, you know, she come walk into the room. I don't care what's on. That's going to be turned off. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to sit right in front of her. The phone's nowhere near around. I'm looking at her in her eyes. She's talking. I'm going, yes. Okay. That's great. I'm not taking any notes. I don't need to. Right. In some cases, in some cases, I may. I may take mm -hmm. a little jot down something, a little shorthand or something, because I, I may not, I mean, I want to get back to it. But yeah, but you're you're all in. And when you're all in like that, people recognize that they realize that. And you really earn their respect with regarding being an effective listener. But mm. that's uh, and that's something that builds up over time. But guess what? You again, you must know yourself. You must know. You must be able to have people evaluate you at meetings and get feedback. So that's another thing about effective communication is fee a feedback loop. Now, the people who have more feedback loops, wow, they do extremely well because yeah. they're evaluating situations so they can get better. It's almost like, you know, we want to better our game. We're talking about sports. Well, guess what? Relationship building is a sport. You can, mm. you can better your game by making sure you get the feedback. And if you, because guess what? You and I, we never see ourselves in action. We don't. Yeah. Other people see us, but we don't see us. Yeah. So we can't look at film, Darren. We got to get yeah. somebody else to interpret the film for us. And if we get three interpretations that are the same, we know where we went wrong in that meeting. Make sense? That makes a lot of sense. So th there's so much, so many jewels um, that popped up there. There's this idea of accountability. Uh, feedback is one that I want to talk about right now. Um, I believe as men, there are times where we can get into um, this bad place. I'm a man. Can't nobody tell me nothing. I know I'm right. Uh, this and this and that and that, and we are closed down to feedback. Yeah. And sometimes that happens in our 
marriages, especially uh, uh, with our wives. I mean, I had my daughter tell me something the other day. Uh, she says, daddy, uh, cause we have two dogs at home. I'm not a dog lover, but I love my wife and I love my daughter. Right. And we have this little Rottweiler puppy that yeah. we're trying to change, uh, to, trying to train. And he hopped up on the couch mm. and went after somebody's, you know, snack. Right. And the first thing that I did is I just grabbed him by his collar yep. and flung him off. Like that's a no, no. <laughs> right. right? And my daughter is saying, daddy, daddy, I, I can't hear anything. I'm just like, oh, no, you will. And fling it. And my, my daughter says to me, um, uh, daddy, me and mommy were calling you. When you get angry, you don't listen. Mm. I was like, wow. Yeah. Right. When you get angry, you don't listen. So my daughter is giving me feedback, but then my wife gives me feedback later and says, you know, when you get angry like that, you really scare our daughter. And at first I'm, I'm, I'm a man. I had to do what I had to do. I had to, right? How important is it as a man to make sure that you have yourself under control, to make sure that your masculinity is uh, 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 properly defined, to take feedback from the main woman, if you're married, your wife, and uh, in your life, how important is that feedback? Not just because you want to hear her, because you know it has something to do with your development. How important is that? Man, you know that's massive, and and the reason being is the fact that when we think about those things that happen, like once again, if you put anger on a spectrum from zero to ten, we also have to think about. Uh, velocity of anger mm. and velocity of anger is that you know some people who are working on their anger because they're working on it their velocity slows down mm -hmm. some people but the but the problem with that with some men is that because it's slowing down and you've been working on it for a while it could go from one to nine in no time yeah and that becomes a problem so yeah and i'm speaking about myself mm -hmm. i'm not a guy who gets angry a lot but if i do it's a bad situation yeah and it comes from the genetics of my father right and how i'm built so for me it's been years that i've basically every day i'm keeping a beast in the basement yeah so the key thing here is, is that number one is just understanding what your triggers are. Mm -hmm. If you know what your triggers are, you can avoid them. And for mm -hmm. me, you know, I'll tell you right now, I'd be on my hands and knees just praying that I don't be involved in certain situations because that will trigger me for, to go from zero to nine. And I don't mm -hmm. want to be in that situation. So yeah, when we're dealing yeah. with our, so if we think about, I'm, I'm going to turn this back to our wives and our daughters and people around us and about listening is that how do we kind of look inside when things are starting to creep up? So we have to say, okay, if this, if these triggers exist, what are they? And when they start to actually creep up, how do I basically disarm them in my head? Mm -hmm quickly so i don't go to from a two to a five to a six to a seven so that those are the most important things but i'm gonna tell you number one it's not hard it's not it's not easy number two you really have to know yourself and number three those feedback loops are so important so when that event occurs you can sit down with your daughter and discuss it you can sit down with your wife and discuss it and the more you discuss it the more you the more you own it but also the better you control it. Yeah, man, we're we're in a good space right now. I'm gonna stay in this pocket before I hop uh, anywhere else. Uh, there are men in the world who are their insecurities may scare them to talk with another man like this. Yes, right. There are men in the world who will look at this as being too sensitive, or yes. right. Yeah because we're talking a lot about internal, about being yes. still, about yep. noticing. We talked earlier about how we have to be a safe space for our wives to come and being good husbands. 
Um, but let's talk about this now, how you find a safe space with your wife to discuss feelings with her that you may not discuss in other places, right? I, like it took me a while to be able to go to my wife um, and actually phrase the feeling that I, you know, man, we just be like, yo, what you just said to me was very disrespectful. That's how you start, right? That's the tough core. It took me a while to be able to go to my wife and say, man, what you said to me really hurt my feelings. Yeah. Right? Like, like that is a whole nother area of boner. I'm about to tell this woman she, so like, how do you as a man and how, and what advice would you give to men as husbands on how beneficial it is to be able to put your hands on some of those, what we learned are softer feelings, but very important feelings and to be able to give them to your wife in a way where you're still a man, you're not whining and crying yeah. like a little boy, yeah. right? She's not your mom, right? Yeah. You're not doing that, but you're actually letting her inside yeah. to say, man, I'm feeling this. Or you could come home from work, man, somebody at the job talked to me today in a way that it really made me feel like this. Talk to me a little bit about that. The first thing I'm going to say, which is so important, is timing. So mm -hmm. when you end up having a situation and somebody made you feel really out of sorts and you now you in your feelings, right? You're actually yeah. in your feelings, right? In them, you right. In them, right. <laughs> Knee deep in them. So yeah. once, once you get to the point where you're like, okay, man, man, it took me there and you get a hold of yourself, you kind of, what it's a good exercise to kind of walk through it. Now, in some cases you can even walk through it and just jot down bullets on paper and say, Hey, here's where I, here's what, here's everything that went down in chronological order of events. Now this might say, this might sound for some man, that's too much. But what it'll do mm. is you'll really, it's a thinking, it's a thinking uh, activity. And it yeah, makes you yeah. think about what went down. Now, you don't want to, you really don't want to have that conversation with someone, with your wife. If something went down with you and your wife, I want to have a clear, I want to get to the point to having a clear head about it. So that's why I may write it down. And when I write it down, I can look at it and say, okay, I want to touch base on these things that went down, but I want to do it as I, in, a, in an objective manner as I can. That mm -hmm. means that timing is very important. So guess what? Many times when something went down and it was really bad and I'm still in the back of my head, it's still going around and you know I, I might even be harboring some feelings about it. I need to be able to come and talk to her when things are very good. So we're out, we're having a great time. And I say, you know, and some people wouldn't do this, but I'll say, hey, you know, I love you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I start off like that. I preface it. I said, man, I love, I love you, girl, you know. And then I, and now I said, I need to talk to you about something, though. I said, now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, make the mic too, you know, too, uh, you know, too tight. But would you mind if we talk about what happened the other day? And then we'll have that conversation. Or I might take her yeah. out where everything is good. You're just going out for a cup of coffee. You're going out for a little lightweight date, have a cup of coffee, cup of tea, and you bring that up when you're when you're settled and you're not, you're not, you're you're you're, you're able to basically walk through it. And I think that yeah. sometimes we bring stuff up at the wrong time. Man, and that's well, it escalates to something that we that we have we did not want to do. So it's kind of like you want to set the you want to set the table to come through mm -hmm. at the right timing and everything going now she's totally open for the conversation matter of fact she may be impressed the fact that you're bringing it up and the fact that you want to talk to her but you have to preface it with the intention the intention is number one, well first of all i love you but the intention is to make our relationship better so this is why i'm bringing this up because what, what i'm about to drop on you you're about to drop something on me that's going to make me better you understand yeah. what I'm saying, baby? And then you then, then you go into the conversation. Man, that that's that's uh that's a jewel right there. Look, I, I I'm thinking I'm getting this stuff for somebody else. I'm getting too much right now. I never thought about it like that because I'm a conflict aggressive person, right? 
Um, and I'm not conflict aggressive because I like to be in conflict. I'm conflict aggressive because I believe that conflict is when it's there, it's naturally there. It's the shortest way to the other side. If we go around it or we try to wait, we take too long and we jeopardize. But what you just taught me is that just because there's conflict there, it doesn't mean it has to be handled right in that moment. Right. You have to find the right time to handle this conflict in a proper way, yes. which totally, you know, uh, um, helps me, especially with my wife, because we process at different speeds, right? I'm a person that wants to talk about it now. Let's talk about it now. My wife is just like, I need time. I need time to think. I need time to process. Um, all of these uh, jewels that you're dropping lead me to one word, intimacy. Mm -hmm. we when when especially as men sometimes and, and I talked about this with one of our other guests and it just keeps coming up because you said something about this first we are stuck between entertainment and intimacy mm -hmm. some of us actually get married because we want a woman to entertain us for the rest of our life right there's something that they, that they may offer we think they may offer in that moment um but then when it's time to build intimacy, we don't have those muscles develop, the being able to listen, the understanding how to date your wife, um, understanding uh, how to build safe spaces, right? If you had to give a man a guide, a three-step guide to the things that he must know, like, you know, this is like giving a man a required reading list. This is what you need to know in order to be a man that knows how to build and interact the right way with intimacy, what three things are you giving them? Wow. So I would say the first thing I really have to know, I really have to know myself and I have to know how I understand intimacy. That's my definition, right? Mm -hmm. Then I had to ask mm -hmm. her, what is your definition of intimacy? I want to make sure that we're on the same page and we believe that intimacy is the same for each other mm. and then if it's not the same for each other how do we get to the place where we say that hey we believe that this is intimate for the for both of us because if it's just intimate for me <laughs> well that ain't gonna fix it for her right you know what I mean you know if I say and let's that, just put this disclaimer in here Deke when we're talking about intimacy as men our mind automatically goes to sex Correct. But this intimacy we're talking about is outside of the bedroom. This is a totally different thing. It could be something as simple, Darren, as holding her hand. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as that. She'll yeah. say, that's intimate for me, but you never want to hold my hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You feel me? I remember yeah. going through that a couple of times and not even recognize it, you know? So now you figure out what that, once you figure out what that is, you can then bring that to the fold, share that with her. She shares that with you. So now you got this, again, you got this, this back and forth of sharing information and of sharing that information, you're creating this brocade, this fabric between the two of you. And over time, it gets stronger and stronger to the point. I know you would probably remember this when people used to play the newlywed game. And they mm -hmm. would ask questions and people would, you know, the people who would win, they really know their spouse well, right? Yeah. So if you think about, you know, how you, how do you really get totally in her head and understanding what she likes, what she doesn't like, these nuances of who she is as a woman, mm -hmm. right? And then sharing who you are as a man that level of intimacy is beyond, obviously, like you said earlier, it's totally beyond sexual. That becomes spiritual. Mm. That becomes emotional. I know, I know her micro expressions. My wife knows I can see certain expressions on her face and I know where she is. Yeah. And she does, she doesn't know I know that, but I told her right. many times, I'm like, I know. I, yeah. I saw that micro expression. I know where you are. I'm not mad. Yes, you are. I know. You're mad. <laughs> Come here. Because and, and, I've 
That's right. It's not about just me being right. I've paid attention yes. to you so much in an yes. intentional manner. Yes. Right. Yes. That I, I know. Right. 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 I, I, I know what's going on here. You um, study, man. you study her to the nth degree and it never gets old. Mm. And mm -hmm. as you're studying her, she's going to reflect the same sort of behavior because she's going to see the benefit from it. So that's the level of intimacy that we're talking about. Yeah. You're moving forward and forward, right? And you're taking these small, you're looking at, especially when you're away, if you're on vacation, when you're in a different setting, right? You're studying, constantly being, you're being a, a student of your wife's behavior. Mm. Yeah, that's big. That's big. Um, man, this is this is good. This is too good for me. I, I don't even know where to go because what 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 you have been doing for me during this talk is you have taken taken marriage from being this total thing we look at on the outside. And you've showed us how to frame the quality on it on the inside, right? Is, is my mind right? Um, am, am I, is my focus right in studying my mate? Is my heart right in knowing myself yes, and right. who I am? Yeah. Is my heart available in a way to give it to her, right? Like this is all internal work. It's all yes. internal work. And what happens a lot of the times is we see couples and we say to them, man, y'all so cute. Y'all this, y'all that, uh, but and and what and they get wrapped up sometimes and looking good on the outside yeah. and not putting in that internal work. Right, that internal work takes time. Right. What do you recommend um, for individuals to make sure they're taking care of the internal work? Is it conferences? Is it counseling? Um, is it? Uh, Lack, no distractions there is a night where you don't watch tv you don't have your phones you just sit there and talk with one another what would you recommend for this deep internal work that you're talking about yeah so you know tom tom time and time again i will ask a brother or even a young sister depending upon you know who i'm engaged engaging with whether it be at work wherever right when i'm out there where, when, when's the last conference or course that you've attended to improve your marriage? And nine, time, time, nine times out of 10, what do you think they say? Uh, uh, did they talk about something that happened years ago or I haven't or, yeah. So if we don't get it in, if we don't get it at home and we don't get it in school, and we don't get it in college, well, where are you getting it from? Mm -hmm. So conferences and things like that, classes that are free, that's something that they should actually have on their calendar and make that intentional. Hey, is this thing coming up? We should go to this. Why? We don't need this. That's what the man usually says. We don't need this. We're doing okay. Don't you want to make it better? Don't yeah. you want to improve? Don't you want to grow? So conferences, um, classes, and things of that nature, definitely on the calendar, you know, jot it in. The other thing is, can we read a book together? Mm. Just sit down, cut off the TV, have a book. Something like, say, five love languages. Can yeah. we learn something about each other? And then we can have a discussion, right, amongst each other. But third thing, me and you talking right now. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking right now, why should we always talk about, Darren, basketball? Why can't we talk about something deeper? Yeah. Why can't I just call you up and say, listen, yeah, we are going to go to the game. But after the game, I got an agenda at dinner. And yeah. my agenda is about A, B, and C. And I need you to tell me, how did I handle this? Did I handle it wrong? Give me some tips, Right. And now we have this conversation going back and forth amongst our circle. And amongst our circle, we can have intentional conversations that's going to make each other better. Just like 
when we go to the ball, the basketball court, and I know I'm, I know we're looking for a game to play with somebody better than us so we can get better. I want to up my mm. game. I got to get with people that already has nice game. So now yeah. we have those conversations. But these are the things that we must do intentionally to make ourselves better to grow. In my mind, marriage is a sport. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what are you, what are you practicing? You working yeah, on your yeah. handle? You working on your rap? Say your rap is your handle. You working on your handle? <laughs> yeah. If you ain't working on your handle, you're going to have a problem in the long term. You have to learn well to love well. And then let me go here. You said this, and I totally believe this. The best wedding gift I got was it wasn't actually a tangible gift. It was um, a time that was put together. Um, and I don't know, Deke, you might have been there. I think you might, I think you might have, have been there when I was getting married. Um, uh, Dan Trusty, who had been my youth pastor, you know, for years, young adult, he got a group of men gathered, right? And we sat in a circle. We had food and everything. This was this was the bachelor party. We had some food, we ate, we talked, but at the end, they got in a circle. And mm -hmm. each man said, Man, here is what I want to say to bless your marriage. Here is a warning that I want to give you about marriage. I'll be praying for it. Man, that was monumental for yeah. me. What yeah. has to happen for men to get past our conversation being about the distractions of life? When it comes down to it, for real, for real, I love sports. And I, you know, I tell my wife all the time, she'll say to me on Sunday, why are you not watching the football game? And I'll say to her, man, them men at work, right? They doing their job. If I have responsibility that I need to take care of, I can't sit down and watch another man work while I'm being lazy, right? I may not be able to catch that game. So it's a distraction, really. Yeah. What happens, what needs to happen for us men to move past talking about all the distractions in our lives, whether it be the sports, whether it be work, and actually get down to those intimate things where I can confide in another brother and say, hey, man, bro. I just feel like I'm blowing it. Yeah. Right. And that brother can say to me, man, Doc, listen, I understand you feel that, but you're not. Or they can say, man, you are, but this is how we can change it. What needs to happen with us as men that we can be better husbands because we've become more transparent um, and vulnerable men? Yeah. Now, at some point back in the day, we used to have these, uh, they used to call them glory and honor groups at our church. Yeah, and men men would be together, and they would do that very thing once a week. They get together, they got some food, and they just have real talk. Now, at the end of the day, if you're not intentional about it, you can't improve your game. If we take this right back to the sports analogy, that's all right. You know, if I'm gonna get up five o'clock in the morning and work on my three pointer, right? I'm gonna get up mm -hmm. five o'clock and work on my handle. And I got, I got a pad with me, Darren is going to say, I need to do this. I need to take these many shots. I need to, I need to dribble in this manner. Here's my dribbling tasks. Why don't we have that for our wives? Why don't yeah, we have yeah. like a list that says, these are the things that I need to do to improve my marriage, to improve me being a husband. It does have to be intentional. It has to be written in the calendar. So if you and I, are going to get together every Thursday and we're going to get together with four or five, six other guys. That's going to help us improve our marriage, but mm -hmm. if it's not set up like some people. Some people can go out there five o'clock in the morning, wake up, go to the gym and do it by themselves because they have yeah. that level of discipline. Others, they need that camaraderie to help them do it because what it does is that it creates habits and once they create the habits, they create routines. And once they start those routines, now they're good to go on it. But everybody's not built the same to have that, that level of um, discipline to even start that on their own. So we need yeah. each other, right? We need each other to encourage each other, to build each other up. And not to just talk about it, but to actually make the date. Not to say, yeah, we're going to get together. And never That's right. Together. That's right. That's right. <laughs> See, this is so convicting because I was um, talking to my wife actually this morning, but it was about something totally different. 
um, it was about going to the gym. Um, I had my Peloton at home and everything like that, but I realized I needed a trainer because I don't know enough to get me to where I need to be. Mm -hmm. And I told her I've been getting up and I've been, you know, consistent uh, for a few weeks. And I said, man, it became a lot easier when all I had to do was get up and make it to the gym and have somebody else help me figure out what to do. Yeah. Right. Instead of me trying to do it on my own, I don't know how the body works. I don't know which weight to do it. I don't know. Right. But I have somebody showing me how to do that. And I think that that's the same thing for marriage that um, some of us, and that's okay. Are either we've been in this um, uh, for a small amount of time, or we tried to do it on our own and we need help. Now you need to be connected with people who are going to guide you and yes. show you how to do yes, it yes. or you, you need and and we get so private and so personal i don't want nobody in my business yes that's my wife can't nobody else tell me how to bro you need it because yes. if you don't get it you ain't gonna have no wife yep right yeah you, you know so we need to um that's powerful well let's talk about this marriage happens in seasons mm-hmm. i'm in a season in my marriage right now that i i never thought i would be in and i'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly but won't you tell me tell me what was what has been the most challenging season season of your marriage and what was the most exciting season of your marriage if you can pick and pinpoint yeah so i would say challenging probably when the, the first challenge was uh our first baby uh, when we had uh our firstborn man uh, he found out that he had sickle cell and we didn't know mm. really much about it, what it was. And yeah. she broke, she broke down and, um, you know, I'm trying my best to, to basically, um, console her and things of that nature. And, um, we started studying, figuring out mm-hmm. what we need to do, you know, make sure we got with the best doctors. The other por- portion of that. So I, when I say it, it was sickness, uh, one, you know, one day we found out with our last born that CC ended up, you know, contracting lupus. And that yeah. was a big deal. You know, she had lost so much weight and she got down to like, I don't know, like 90 pounds at one point. And then they threw on steroid, steroids and then she gained, I think she doubled her weight from, from that perspective. So she ended up being yeah. like, you know, getting up, you know, she, she, she doubled her weight. So in any case, those were challenging. And during that time is when I really valued what CC did from the standpoint of being able to work as a mom and, mm-hmm. and, um, and a worker. I didn't realize mm-hmm. all she did because when she got sick, we, I had three little kids. Yeah, I had to take care of all of them, including her. And I was in school. Yeah. And it was, it was, you know, at that point I said, man, I really appreciate what women do because, um, you know, I got a taste of that and I had a whole brand new outlook on that, but Mm -hmm. that was my trying season was, uh, uh, through sickness. And the one, if I flip it to, um, to, um, just an awesome challenge, uh, awesome season from a standpoint of, um, just beautiful season, having kids. You know, mm. just having that ha- having those babies man I mean I ain't gonna lie to you I mean I don't you know my my kids they're not ready for any kids yet but yeah if they were ready to get married and have the grandkids I'm looking forward to it right because uh you know I always I always had an affinity towards uh babies for some reason you know what I mean mm-hmm. I see other people you know carry their babies around and play with they you know play with their babies right but that part portion of it being able to be on the floor watching a watching a one-year-old you know learn you know yeah watching my my kids I used, they used to sleep on my chest I would you know I would put them to bed and the way I would put them to bed is they would be on my chest and they fall with you know they got their head laying on my chest and now put them to sleep all that sort of thing man was uh was great because it was Cece and I bonding you know we had this baby and we're bonding with that baby you know so think of it like as you you know, as we, as men, at some point 
during that time, we're bonding with the baby, but we're also bonding with our wives at the same time. So the three of you are bonding together. And I think that that was really a, a blessing to really take notice of what was going on and how, how that family now is strengthening. It was just, here's my wife, but now we got a family. We're not a couple anymore. Yeah. We're a family. And that's yeah. a different, that's a different, it's a different vibe. So um, second to last question. Uh, this is phenomenal. Uh, one of my favorite books is a book by the title of uh, Is Marriage for White People, right? Mm. And is written by um, a professor that was at Stanford. Um, Ralph Ebanks is his name. It might be pronounced Eubanks, Ebanks. And he gets this story because he has, uh, he's visiting this fourth grade classroom in Washington, D.C. And he's leaving out and he says to these children, um, I have friends, who would you want me to invite from my friends to come speak to you? One of the little boys says, um, we want somebody to come and show us how to be, uh, talk to us about being a dad. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he says to them, all right, well, I'll get some of my married friends to come and tell you about being a dad. And the fourth grader looks up to him and says, we don't want to be married. We just want to learn how to be a dad. Marriage is for white people. Wow. And that's where he gets the title from his book. If you were talking to that fourth grade class after that little boy said that, hmm. how would you explain how valuable, how important, and how essential marriage is for him to thrive mm -hmm. as a man when he gets older. Yeah. So marriage, there's a level of responsibility, right? So unfortunately, some men, they're constantly running away from responsibility. And what mm -hmm. that young man is, that's what he has, he's witnessed over the years is a, a, a number of people that, uh, that he has witnessed running away from responsibility. Yeah. So when you marry somebody, you basically become one. That person is now one with you. And there's a level of responsibility, but if you can't take care of yourself, if you fail to actually be responsible for yourself, in other words, you are not able to lead yourself. You won't be able to lead your wife or mm. anybody else. You will actually have trouble with that. Now, a man who obviously men sometimes get divorced or they mm -hmm. get separated. Now, that doesn't mean that that man can't learn from his mistakes or even maybe he didn't even, maybe it wasn't even his fault. Maybe something went down where that relationship uh, faltered and maybe his spouse uh, decided to just leave. In any case, you're looking at somebody who's going to say to themselves, I've basically grown from this situation. I know I've learned what I've learned within this situation, but now I know how to pour that experience into my next relationship. And part of that is dealing with the, if there's kids involved. So responsibility is a big one. The other thing is this loyal love. So you, you have a, if you have a baby with somebody and there's a certain level of love with that woman that you had that baby with. Now, I'm not, I'm now obviously God can do anything. So mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to love her in the beginning, but you can actually grow in loving that person depending upon mm. the level of loyal loyalty that you have with, I would say, if in fact you're a believer, that level of loyalty you have and faith that you have with God, yeah, with Christ, right? And then that rolls into that bond that you end up having. So that loyal love. Then you have, um, I would say, 
some men have a problem with basically providing the level of security that a woman needs. And then they look on the inside, unfortunately, and say, well, I don't know if I'm able to provide that security that she needs. Then they mm. make excuses regarding why they don't want to stay with that woman. There's yeah. a lot of things that go on the inside of us. So I would just, for that, you know, for that classroom, just giving them those points about, you know, being responsible. Because if you're responsible and if you if you're not responsible in that area, there might be a lot of other areas that you're not being responsible for or things that you're running away from. So that's a certain level of courage that you're going to have the need to actually stay in a marriage a certain level of strength, mental strength and spiritual strength to stay in that marriage. What are you willing to fight for? See, it's many brothers out here willing to fight for a lot of stuff. But I mean, are you really, really willing to fight for your marriage? Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about what's going down between you and her, are you really, really willing to fight for it? But people give up. And now, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that we go through. And there's a lot of things that we can endure. But when we see other people out there and we ask them the question, okay, what made you stay together? There's a lot of men will tell you that, man, I fought for this. Yeah, this yeah. was not child's play. I had yeah. to, I wanted to stick with her. So I went out and fought. Just like we fight out, <laughs> we, a lot of times we fight over stuff that doesn't ma even matter. But we're not mm. going to fight for that marriage. So I think that, you know, yeah. that grounded foundation and that true belief in um, when you stand up and you get married in front of the Lord and you make these commitments and promises to him, right? And you, and you, and you light that candle as one, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. We take that very, some of us take that very lightly. But at the end of the day, in my mind, when you light that candle together, we become one. We don't want to blow that flame out. We want to fan that flame, right, to keep it going. That's, That's right. a fight, man. That's a fight. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think I'll that, leave you that with is. That. Yeah, I'll leave you with that, man. It's, it's a fight. You know? So basically, yeah. if you and you want to, you know, you want to work at it, it's a, it's a thing that you never really, you don't stop fighting. You fight every day for it. Everything that comes up, you're fighting every day to maintain that flame flowing. You know? Man, that, that's um, amazing. And I think that's one of the truths that a lot of us need to be taught as men, especially young Black men. The greatest warrior is the one that knows how to be more intense in love than he does anything else, right? He's yeah. gonna handle his business. If it comes down yeah. to needing to do some of that, that's cool. But how intense are you in being able to fight for and fight with love? Yeah. That's, that's big. Last question. If you had a blimp, Goodyear blimp, or you were standing on a bridge waving a sign or a banner, and you could tell the world, warn the world or encourage the world about one thing in marriage you can give them one message what would your message be what are you putting on the blimp to fly around the world and get everybody's eyes to look at and read and take in what's your message stay courageous hmm Stay courageous. You have to be in a mindset that fear may come, but you have to move forward. So staying courageous is a foundational piece that when it goes bad and you know, we don't talk about, like you said earlier, we don't talk about a lot of our fears. Yeah. We don't talk about yeah. them. We fear a lot of things. Yes. The question is, how much of those fears are impeding our progress? Mm. 
That's really the question. If we if we had something like say, I, well, I had ten fears today, and I only got over two of them. How much are how much is it impeding our progress? How much is it? How much is it? Are we allowing? Are we allowing the other entities that are in the world, these things that are in the world that's stopping us from reaching our goals to basically control our lives? Yeah. So we, we got to have that level of courage to keep moving forward. We also have to have a level of courage just to, you know, just to reach out for help. Mm. Right. That's courage involved with just reaching out for help. Hey, brother Darren, help me out, man. I'm drowning here. I'm choking. Or do we just tap out? Yeah. Tap out. Or act like the problem's not there, right? Try to yep. ignore it long enough that we'll think it'll go away. Yep. Um, well, Rod, let me tell you, this was definitely a time, um, a privilege for me. I had so much other stuff. I know you're going to be back because we need to talk about entrepreneurship and marriage. We need to talk about not letting yourself go and staying physically fit or getting physically fit as a man in marriage. So you're going to be a more than one time guest, but this went right where it needed to be. I felt uh, like during this uh, conversation, men got a chance to think about the art and science of learning how to love, right? The art and science of learning about marriage, of learning your mate. And it just has me in a place where I'm just so still and curious um, and even thinking about some of the things that I can do in my own life to make sure that I am paying attention, that I'm focused and that I am learning. I'm reading a book now uh, by a guy by the name of Cal Newport. You probably read it. It's called Deep Work. Um, mm -hmm. And it talks about how those in the future who are going to be the superstars in their career fields or those who understand yeah. what it takes to focus and get hard things mm -hmm. quick. Yeah. Like they know how to cut out all the distraction and do the deep work. Yeah. The marriages that survive, not just survive, the marriages that thrive are those who know how to do the deep work. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what was that, you what was that put author? us, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't Deep Cal work, Newport, right. and he talks about your field also. He comes from a tech background, um, yeah. and um, I realize that he says this. There are two things, and you talked about them. If you do not learn how to, if you do not learn how to learn, you will not thrive. And if you do not learn how to produce, you'll never be great. Mm. Yep, absolutely. That's it. That's right. It. Like, like yeah. that's the story. And <laughs> that's it. yeah, you can pick up and put down as many things, but do you know how to learn hard things? Yeah. And do you know how to produce at a level, at a quality level? Yeah. If you can pick up those two things and that's hard work. And he talks about doing the deep work that is needed um, in order to accomplish that marriage is something that if it's going to thrive, it just takes an amazing amount of deep work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And no you doubt. have to be no able doubt. to do that. Well, so thank yeah. you so much for joining us. This was a treat for me. I hope it was a treat for all of those who are watching. I'm very excited about men being encouraged yeah. to say to somebody, I need help. I need to yes. learn yes. after hearing this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you everybody for watching this episode of husbandry. Thank you, Rod, for joining us. And yeah, we'll see you. Me. No problem, doc. We'll see you next time. All right, man.